Welcome to this episode of The Aquarist Sedge, a podcast for home aquarists just like you. Learn more about how to keep a thriving aquarium and discover ideas and tips to give your aquarium the edge. And now, over to our host, Arthur Preston. It's simple, it's cheap, it's available almost everywhere. It's salt. No, not the salt you will use to season your latest culinary creation, but aquarium salt. Probably one of the most misunderstood substances in this entire hobby. So today's episode is going to explore aquarium salt. What is it used for? When do we use it? Can it sometimes be dangerous? What is it actually doing in your tank? And why do some people swear by it, while others avoid it like the plague? We're going to look at the chemistry behind salt and its effect on freshwater fish, We're going to look at the concept of osmoregulation. We're going to look at the uses of salt in the aquarium and the different tolerance to salt across different species, different applications, um, things to consider when using salt and so on. So hopefully this will be an opportunity to learn more about this useful substance and uh, it will guide you and help you in making good decisions about using aquarium salt in your tanks. So that all said, Let's get into it. To really understand why aquarium salt can help or harm, we need to dig a little bit into fish physiology, especially something we call osmoregulation. Freshwater fish live in an environment where water is constantly trying to rush into their bodies due to osmosis. Their internal fluids are saltier than their surroundings, so water naturally wants to equalize the balance by flowing in. Their gills, kidneys, and specialized cells called chloride cells are constantly working to pump out this excess water and retain salt. It's a very energy intensive process. So when you add a small amount of salt to the water, you reduce the osmotic gradient. And that means simply means that their bodies don't have to work as hard. It reduces stress on the gills and kidneys and gives them more energy to fight off disease. And their mucous membrane thickens slightly offering more protection from pathogens. And that's basically why aquarium salt can be so effective during stressful periods such as transport or disease outbreaks or high nitrite levels. Now salt doesn't directly kill bacteria or viruses in freshwater tanks, but it does make your fish stronger to fight them off. Just something interesting for those of you who are interested in marine fish as well, not something this podcast deals with, but this is an interesting fact. Marine fish face the opposite problem. They're constantly losing water to the salty environment and they drink seawater to compensate. So it's all about gradients of salinity. So when should you use aquarium salt? Let's get into the nitty gritty of this. Aquarium salt has specific science backed applications and this is where it really shines. So let's deal with these. Firstly, external parasites such as ick can be addressed by the use of salt. The salt helps in two ways. Number one, it speeds up the parasite's life cycle, pushing it to the vulnerable free swimming stage much faster. And two, it also helps your fish's mucus coat or slime coat thicken and recover. In mild infestations of ick, salt alone at the right concentration and with increased aeration and heat may clear things up. That's not only true for ick, it's any external parasites. Then there's the issue of nitrite poisoning. When your tank is cycling or your filter crashes, Nitrite spikes. Salt blocks nitrite absorption through the gills by providing chloride ions that compete with the nitrite. So to deal with this, you add one gram of salt per liter of water during a nitrite spike. And this gives about 60 milligrams per liter of chloride, which is enough to prevent nitrite toxicity. After a long shipment, water change or aggressive encounter in your tank, adding about a half to one gram of salt per litre can reduce stress, boost osmoregulation and calm fish down. It's a great tool for stress recovery. It also helps with minor wounds and fin rot. A slightly salted tank or short-term salt bath can help mild external bacterial or fungal infections. Salt acts as a mild irritant and that triggers mucus production and accelerated healing. Now there are certain fish that in their natural habitat inhabit a more brackish Uh, water. So live bearers such as mollies or guppies and swordtails often do better with a little bit of salt, especially in hard water, because it mimics their natural environment. 
and salt can also be used in quarantine and hospital tanks. Salt is a safe, affordable support tool to use alongside medications. It doesn't interfere with most antibiotics and can reduce secondary infections. So those are the ways in which we can use aquarium salt, but are there times when we should not use it? Well, absolutely. In fact, if used incorrectly, it can cause more problems than it solves. So let's look at some of these issues. Number one, um, at low concentrations, many aquatic plants suffer. Salt disrupts osmosis at the cellular level in plants as well. There are certain species that are more sensitive to this, such as Vallisneria, Cryptocorians, and most stem plants. More tolerant to salt are plants such as Java fern, Anubias, and Hornwort, although excess salt with those plants will also cause issues. Loaches, Corydoras, um, Otocinclus, and some wild caught species lack the protective slime coat that helps buffer against salt exposure. So using salt when you have a number of these fish or using too much salt um, can cause these fish to go into osmotic shock. So be careful and be deliberate and measured in how you use salt when you have aquariums that contain these particular species. Also be aware of the effect of salt on shrimp. Shrimp do not tolerate salt particularly well because it dehydrates them very rapidly. Uh, and snails may survive low levels of salt, but it slows down their reproduction, which I guess for some people may not be a bad thing. So what then are the effects of long-term use of salt in a community tank? Well, if you're using it all the time, it can stress salt-sensitive fish, it can kill your plants, it can lead to pathogen resistance over time, and it can disrupt nitrifying bacteria if used in high concentrations. And a common mistake is forgetting to only add salt for water removed during a change. Salt does not evaporate, it stays in the water column. And also please never pour dry salt directly into a tank. Always dissolve it first. If you don't do that, it can cause gill burn or irritation to the skin of the fish. So how then do you go about dosing aquarium salt accurately? So let's move now from the theory of salt to actual practice. Here's how to dose safely and effectively. So what are your dosage guidelines? Well, for a mild tonic that's for fish that may be stressed, maybe new arrivals, it's as little as a half a gram to one gram per liter. For nitrite protection, one gram per liter. For therapeutic treatment, two to three grams per liter. And for a salt bath in more serious cases or a salt dip, it's 10 to 30 grams per liter for five to 10 minutes. How do you prepare a salt dip? Well, you're going to use clean, uh, dechlorinated water, the same temperature as your tank. You put the water into a container, you dissolve the salt in the water, and when that's done, you net the fish that you need to take out and place them in the dip for five to 10 minutes at most. You observe the fish closely. Take the fish out if it rolls or gasps for air, and then return to the main tank or hospital tank. When you are doing a water change, only replace the salt that is removed during water changes. For example, if you're treating at two grams per liter in a 100 liter tank and you change 25 liters, only redose 50 grams, not the full 200 grams again. So, what about some of the issues around treating with salt? So, let's look at some real world problems. You may see live berries in particular f uh, flashing. No, that's not what you might think it is. Flashing is when they um, so up and they kind of turn on their side and they rub themselves against the gravel or against an object in your aquarium. Some folks might say, well, even after I've treated with salt, my fish are still doing that. So you're going to want to check for parasites that are resistant to salt, such as flukes. Um, you want to check that there has not been an incorrect dose or duration of salt treatment. And you also want to check that there aren't underlying water quality problems, such as high ammonia or swings in the pH. You might find that after you've used salt in your aquarium that your plants have now started to melt or die off. It's very possible. Salt sensitive plants may never actually recover. So replace with hardy ones or move the treatment of salt to a hospital tank next time. Now, if you overdose with salt, how do you remove the, the, the salt from the tank? You do this through gradual water changes. Don't do one massive change. Aim for 20 to 30% every second day until the levels normalize. Some people might turn around and say, well, I've dosed for several days with salt and I'm not seeing any changes. The salt doesn't work. Well, salt's not a cure all for everything. 
and it does depend on the disease. Salt's not effective for internal parasites, fungal infections that are beyond the surface of the skin, and gram-negative bacterial infections. Always match the treatment to the diagnosis. Salt is a support, not a substitute for actual medication. So let's bring this all together. Aquarium salt is one of the most affordable, accessible, and versatile tools you can use. But it's a tool, not a universal cure. So the key takeaways from this episode are the following. Understand why you're using salt before adding it. Always dose by weight and replace only what you remove. Know your fish, your plants, and your invertebrates and what salt can and can't do for them. And for serious illnesses, salt can help, but it isn't a replacement for proper medication. Please also bear in mind that table salt is not suitable for aquariums. Whatever you do, do not use table salt. That is a different chemical makeup and will really do damage in your aquarium. Especially if you use something that's additive, such as the Himalayan salt and these other kinds of fancy culinary seasoning salts. It must be aquarium salt. So please don't go to your kitchen, grab the salt out of your cupboard, go chuck some into your aquarium. You are going to have issues if you do that. Make sure that you're using aquarium salt only in your aquariums. That's really important. So please remember that. Folks, that's it for this episode. I trust it has been helpful to you. If it has been, please subscribe or follow the podcast. Please make sure that you leave a review and uh, perhaps share it with a fellow aquarist. I'm really pleased to let you know that we are heading very quickly to 2000 downloads. That's only taken a couple of months and I'm really pleased about that. So thank you to all of you for your support. Thank you for sharing it with others. And um, yeah, very really good to be able to support this hobby in this way. So folks, thanks again. Appreciate your support. I look forward to being with you on the next episode. So keep learning, keep discovering, and keep enjoying this amazing hobby. Until then, bye for now. That's it for this episode of The Aquarius Sedge. Please consider subscribing to this podcast so that you don't miss further episodes. We would love it if you would also rate and review the podcast as this helps make it visible to others. Until next time, keep learning and discovering and keep finding your Aquarius Sedge in this captivating and fascinating hobby.